Okay. Um, so yes, as Caroline said, I've, I've worked on the development of PARP inhibitors and what they do for quite some time. But um, this, this is not only am I trying to condense 30 years work down to about 45 minutes, but what I, I most want to bring out is that um, although there's been a lot of intellectual and physical effort in this without um, at least 10 items of good luck, I don't think we'd be uh, in the successful position that we are. Um, and I, I just want to, to bring out the fact that it is the synergy between science and serendipity that has led to the success of this drug. So this is the beautiful Northumberland um, coastline on a sunny day. So as I said, there's it, a very long timeline here in the development of PARP inhibitors from the discovery of PARP in the 1960s until the present day. So this is, is the timeline. I've highlighted in purple um, the things that we've done in Newcastle um, in contributing to this um, program. So our Although PART was discovered in the 1960s, the first um, inhibitors weren't made until the end of the 1970s and used in the 1980s, which was when they found out what PARP did. Um, and we uh, initiated our PARP discovery, drug discovery program in 1990. Um, and that eventually has culminated in 2016 with the approval of Rebraca or Rucaparib, which is um, the drug that we've uh, developed in Newcastle. So what is PARP? So the first um, hint that there was um, an enzyme um, that responded to uh, DNA damage was um, in 1955, where um, it was found that alkylating agents depleted cells of their um, cellular NAD content and of course, at, at that time, it was only two years after the discovery of DNA and they never connected it. Um, and they thought it was something to do with metabolism. However, then um, in, in the 1960s, a um, group in France, Paul Chambon's group in Chan uh, France, identified that NAD depletion was DNA dependent, but they got the substrate uh, and product uh, wrong. Uh, and it was this beautiful experiment from um, Hayashi's uh, lab in Japan uh, that, that really nailed it. Um, so this was beautifully elegant disappearance of the um, NAD substrate, the appearance of the nicotinamide byproduct, and this is the appearance of the polymer. Um, so, so that they they sh they really showed it. Oh, sorry, um, correctly. So, what does PARP do? So, PARP's involved in the DNA damage response, and it, it's mostly uh, responsive to DNA single strand breaks, um, but DNA breaks in general. Um, and and what it does is it recognizes um, the sort of change in shape of the DNA when it's broken. Um, and it binds to the DNA, and then it takes NAD. Can you? I hope you can see my pointer. I don't know if I can do the. Can I just do the pointer. Um, so it takes NAD as its substrate, and it cleaves NAD between the ADP ribose and the nicotinamide bit, and it sticks the ADP ribose groups in great long polymers attached to acceptor proteins. Now the acceptor proteins are largely PARP1 itself and histones. And this very strong negative charge in the vicinity of the break uh, serves to loosen the chromatin and to recruit um, the enzymes and proteins that actually do the repairing part. Um, so, oops. So, so, when um, we first started uh, developing PARP inhibitors, it was a very simple rationale in that um, anti-cancer agents work by damaging DNA, but PARP activity could be a resistance mechanism in that it repairs the DNA and the cells can survive. So if you come in with a PARP inhibitor, you'll get incomplete repair and the cell will die. 
And this before she came to Newcastle uh, was elegantly shown by Barbara Dirk, actually, and she was in Sydney Shell's lab, that when you treat cells with um, a DNA uh, damaging agent, DNA alkylating agent, DMS here, um, you, you get increasing cytotoxicity with increasing concentration. But if you co-incubate with three amino benzamide, which was the first PARP inhibitor that had just been made by uh, Purnell and Wish, you got a very um, good sensitization of the cells. So that was the rationale uh, that we wanted to do. And so um, we, we took, this is the substrate NAD. This is where it gets cleaved by PARP, releasing nicotinamide. This was known to be a weak PARP inhibitor itself. And these, this is the ADP ribose bits that it sticks in, into great long polymers on proteins. This is three amino benzamide, and this was our starting point, which as you can see is a nicotinamide uh, analog, except that the nitrogen here has been replaced with a, um, a carbon. And then we were um, trying to make uh, compounds sort of liberal, uh, um, uh, developing things that were sort of stuck on here and what have. But the first um, bit of serendipity was. Um, was when we were trying to make something that had like this, um, like this. But what happened was that it rearranged during the, um, the synthesis and actually joined up like this and gave us this compound. So instead of cyclizing down there, it cyclized around here. And this um, was... Um, 200 times more potent than three amino benzamide and a dam site more potent than the um, compound we were trying to make. Um, so that was the first bit of good luck. From there, we went on and we um, increased the potency uh, some more. So now we've got something that is um, around a thousand times more potent than three amino benzamide. And then our second bit of good luck was to meet up with uh, Stenik Ostomsky, who was um, working in Aguron uh, Pharmaceuticals, um, and they did structural biology, crystal-based drug design. We met him in 1996 in one of those EORTC meetings in Amsterdam, and he was very keen on developing PARP inhibitors. He got the PARP construct from Gilbert de Mercier in France, and he got the crystal coordinates from George Schultz, and he got this compound from us. And they co-crystallized it um, in the active site of PARP, and they came up uh, with a series of compounds. Um, and these compounds had this seven-membered ring, and this um, made for greater interactions in the active site and again, um, they were very potent compounds. So um, this was some of the very early studies that we did. Um, so we, we confirmed the studies that had been done with three amino benzamide that showed um, potentiation of DNA methylating agents and ionizing radiation. And here you can see methylating agent on its own and the combination with NU1025, which is our accidentally made first active drug. And here again is ionizing radiation sensitivity. And we tried a variety of different cytotoxic drugs. And the only other class of drug that we found was potentiated was uh, the topoisomerase one poisons. And here you see camptothecin is uh, potentiated by NU1025 really quite nicely. And this is a technique to measure uh, DNA strand breaks called alkaline elution. And the more um, steep this curve is, the more DNA breaks you have. So you can see that camptothecin caused some DNA breaks, and that was increased by NU1025. So, but then um, they made the part knock out mice, and these, these mice were viable and fertile, which um, somewhat threw a spanner of the work in the works because. Um, if PARP is, um, is not needed for development, how effective are our PARP inhibitors going to be? However, Thomas Lindahl, 
um, had shown that PARP inhibition is really quite different from not having PARP there at all. And he did some very um, elegant experiments where he took um, nuclear extracts um, and he um, incubated them with um, a cleaved plasmid. And you, you know that um, they then recirculize, circularize if they um, repair. And what he found was that in the absence of NAD, there was no repair. In the presence of NAD, there was repair. But if you added three amino benzamides, there was no repair. And this is the, the PARP activity here, um, which you can see has been um, very much reduced by three amino benzamide. So then the interesting thing was that he took whole cell extracts and looked at the repair. And again, you can see um, there's nice repair with, um, with NAD present, but not with it when it was absent. But if you took the, um, if you depleted it of PARP, you still got repair whether NAD was there or not. But when, and when you put PARP back in, you've got exactly the same as you, you got when you had the whole um, nuclear extract. So what he thought was happening was that um, in the presence of NAD, PARP would bind to the uh, DNA. Um, it would polyADP ribosylate itself and come away from the DNA and allowing, allowing the DNA repair enzymes to get there and do the repair. But if you had, had no NAD or you had a PARP inhibitor there, then you wouldn't get the polymer formation and you wouldn't get the dissociation of PARP from the site of the break. And so um, PARP would remain on the break, causing an obstacle to repair. So um, this is some of the work we did when we had um, the um, AG14361, which was our first really good lead from, um, from our elaborate, uh, collaboration with Aguron. And as you can see, it was really good radio potentiation. This is in vivo data. So this is the growth of a tumor uh, without irradiation, the slowing of the growth with irradiation and very much more profound slowing of the growth with the radiation and um, giving um, AG14361. Similarly, with topoisomerase 1 poison, erinotecan, you've got slowing of the growth of the tumor, which was um, potentiated by 361. But the most impressive data here was with uh, temozolomide, when you've got reduction in the tumor volume, followed by regrowth. When we um, co incubated, uh, co-treated the mice with 361 at a low dose at five mg per kg, you got um, loss, you got complete tumor regression for 60 days, followed eventually by regrowth. But um, when you used a higher uh, dose of the PARP inhibitor, you got complete tumor regression that went out to the end of the experiment. And we would have gone into clinical trial with AG14361 but that was delayed because um, Aguron was taken over by Warner Lambert. And then about six months later, Warner Lambert was taken over by Pfizer. And I don't think really Pfizer had realized that they were getting this because they weren't an oncology um, pharmaceutical company. Um, however, it did turn out to be um, a good thing in the end because we came up with a much more potent, we went back and re looked at the preclinical data that we had and we and AG14699 was actually a much better drug. And so um, we got the complete tumor regressions with only one mg per kg, whereas it was 15 mg per kg in the uh, previous experiment with um, 361. We also saw that the drug uh, was cleared quite quickly from the plasma, but it was retained for longer in the tumor and it inhibited PARP activity um, in the tumor for a good length of time. Um, but the data was a bit curious in that um, in vitro studies, we could not potentiate temozolomide with our PARP inhibitors. But then using the same cell line, 
this is where we saw the very profound uh, effect uh, in terms of tumor growth. And so it couldn't have been something that was um, to do with the, um, the, the cytotoxicity. It had to be acting on the microenvironment. And of course, nicotinamide was known as a vasodilator. So we looked at that. And what you get because of the high interstitial um, pressure in tumors is you get um, intermittent blood flow. And here you can see in the controls that an area um, that is perfused in the control tumor is not perfused at, at, a, at a later date. So you use two different dyes at 20 minutes apart. And you can see that there are areas that are perfused with the first dye and areas that are perfused with the second dye. And there's a, a lot of mismatch. They're not overlapping. But when you treat with the PARP inhibitor or rather our PARP inhibitor, um, most of the vessels remain open. And this is what you can see with a, a dorsal window chamber that when you add the PARP inhibitor, you get an increase in the um, amount of take up of a fluorescent dye. So um, in 2003, um, the first clinical trial of a PARP inhibitor um, was commenced anywhere in the world. And that was with what we now call rucaparib in combination with temozolomide. Um, and um, this, was, this was based nicely on the preclinical data um, where we would found that we needed at least 50% PARP inhibition for 24 hours, and that was our PARP inhibitory dose. And the, the trial was divided into two parts. In the first part, it would be a patient with any tumor. They would have a half dose of the normal standard dose of temozolomide because we were worried about toxicities, and we would escalate the rucaparib um, until we got to our PARP inhibitory dose. And then the second part was when we were using the PARP inhibitory dose, we would see if we could escalate temozolomide um, to its uh, standard dose. And this was done in melanoma patients who'd um, consented to have pre and post treatment biopsies. And it was accompanied by pharmacodynamic as well as pharmacokinetic uh, assays in terms of measuring PARP activity and DNA breaks. So the next thing is um, in terms of, have I gone too far? I missed last one. Um, okay, oh yes, to do the um, pharmacodynamic uh, studies, we needed to obviously use um, to measure PARP activity. And this, we'd been doing that obviously um, for our inhibitors and it was just um, done by taking NAD um, uh, and looking at its incorporation into ADP ribose. And we used a, a P32 um, tracking system and we looked at its incorporation into macromolecules. In the process of that, we found that um, tissues and cells could be snap frozen for at least 15 work weeks, or uh, and cells could be cryopreserved for 15 weeks without any loss of PARP activity. Moreover, that rucaparib was very sticky. It wasn't washed off when the cells were harvested and the PARP inhibition was retained. And, and also another bit of luck because of its stickiness. So these, I'm numbering my uh, serendipities here. Um, cells could be treated um, with rucaparib and then cryopreserved and tumors from rucaparib treated mice could also be um, stored at minus 80 for at least 15 weeks without any loss of either PARP activity or PARP inhibition. However, this assay, this radioactive assay wasn't sensitive enough for lymphocytes, whereupon our Next, second, sixth bit of serendipity was um, Alex Burkle moved from the University of Constance to Newcastle, and he and Ragan Pfeiffer had developed a much more sensitive assay for PARP activity using an antibody to the um, polymer. So we, um, again, we used that, and the rucaparib stickiness meant that uh, the lymphocytes could be harvested um, and um, separated out by FICOL gradients and the PARP inhibition was maintained and we also found that PARP activity and its inhibition were stable for at least 12 months at minus 80 
which meant that um, it could be a multi-center trial and the um, cells uh, and tumor bits could be sent to us um, on dry ice uh, and we could assay the PARP activity. So um, this is what we found. So at a very low dose, um, one of the starting doses, we saw um, that PARP activity plunged and was um, very low at, at the end of infusion, but gradually came back over 24 hours. And this is the same scene um, when they were in combination with temozolomide. So this was a single dose a week before they got their combination. But by the time we got to 12 mg per meter squared, PARP activity was going down, but wasn't properly recovering over the next 24 hours, such that when uh, the combination was done that the PARP activity was very low. And in fact, this patient came back and had another blood test on the Monday after their last Friday dose and their PARP activity was still, still suppressed. PARP activity was also suppressed in the tumors in a um, dose dependent manner and um, DNA breaks were seen increasing uh, in lymphocytes uh, in a dose dependent manner and they peaked at around four hours after administration. So uh, unfortunately the clinical trials um, did not go that brilliantly although there was some evidence of efficacy there was also an increase in toxicity and um, uh, the sort of toxicity you got with temozolomide. And, and in, in fact, um, in all other PARP inhibitor trials, uh, that's what that has been seen. And so um, on the whole, the, the results were disappointing. At, at best, there was this modest improvement in anti-tumor activity, but quite often that wasn't even seen and there were frequent increases in toxicity. And that would have been the death of PARP inhibitors had it not been um, for the next bit of serendipity, which I'll come on to. So currently, all PARP inhibitors um, are approved for use as single agents, and that includes recaparib. Uh, but it's in, um, in largely in tumors that are defective in homologous recombination DNA repair. So for recaparib, um, it's approved in ovarian and prostate cancer and trials in other tumors are ongoing. But for, for these single agent uh, ones, you need high dose continuous uh, therapy, um, which is it's now approved at 60 milligrams twice a day, whereas um, the uh, maximum tolerated dose in combination with temozolomide was equivalent to 20 milligrams daily for five days. So how did we get there? Okay, so now I have to take a step back and um, emphasize why DNA repair is so important. And that is because all of our cells face a, a constant onslaught uh, of DNA damage. And that's mostly endogenously produced through reactive oxygen and nitrogen species, errors in replication, um, spontaneous uh, methylation and deamination of, um, of the DNA, of bases in the DNA. And of course, there's environmental uh, sources as well. And for every type of DNA damage, there's at least one, possibly more, um, DNA repair pathways. And the DNA damage response is, is not just repair, but it's also signaling to cell cycle checkpoints. And it, it's really beautifully organized. So why is it so important uh, in cancer? Well, in their follow-up um, paper, Hannah Hannon Weinberg, um, who did, originally did the hallmarks of cancer paper, um, highlighted that tumor promoting inflammation and genomic instability and mutation were enabling characteristics um, that allowed cancer to develop. And of course, tumor promoting inflammation causes a lot of DNA damage through a, generating a lot of reactive oxygen species. And instability um, in, in the genome uh, is often due to a dysregulation of the DNA damage response. So, so the next bit of serendipity was um, that was um, 
Thomas Helliday um, coming to talk to us about um, what he'd been finding in terms of um, base excision repair and homologous recombination. So he showed that, um, well, in fact, uh, Thomas Lindahl had, had shown that cells defected in base excision repair or PARP inhibited cells had higher levels of homo homologous recombination. But I think he got the mechanism slightly wrong. So um, what Thomas Helliday showed was that cells that were defective in um, base excision repair had a higher level of gamma H2AX foci, which were probably picking up um, collapsed replication forks where you can get a, an unpaired single uh, double stranded end of DNA. And it also showed that there, this was accompanied by an increase in uh, RAD51 foci, which uh, indicates that homologous recombination is taking place. So um, the next bit of serendipity is that in fact, um, the most common type of DNA damage is actually um, single strand breaks, which are repaired by part dependent base excision repair. And the backup pathway for those is homologous recombination as uh, Thomas Helliday was showing. So the hypothesis that, so if the effects in base excision repair increase homologous recombination repair, the hypothesis um, that he came up with was, was that base excision repair effective cells or PARP inhibited cells for that matter would be dependent upon homologous recombination repair for survival. Well, that on its own would have been just a very interesting uh, observation, but for the fact that around the same time as uh, he showed this, um, the role of BRCA uh, was emerging. So um, BRCA1 was discovered in 1990 and BRCA2 in 94, um, and they're responsible for most hereditary breast and ovarian cancers. So the patient has uh, one damaged uh, gene, but the other one's fine. But the second uh, allele is lost in the tumor. So they become totally defective in um, homologous recombination, or rather they become totally um, defective in BRCA. Um, and it, but in the late 1990s, um, they, they sussed out that BRCA were, both BRCA1 and BRCA2 were involved in DNA repair. And um, it was um, only in 1999 that the first indication that it was the homologous recombination repair pathway that we were involved in. Um, and then uh, it was uh, shown subsequently that, you know, it was confirmed sub subsequently that this was the case. So because Thomas Helliday's data um, was emerging at about the same time as this, um, it led me, oh, that's a funny date. Uh, it wasn't quite that far in the future. It was 2002. Um, after seeing uh, Thomas Helliday's data, um, I, I then it led me to pose the question that um, could Recaparib be uh, used on its own to kill cancers that were defective in homologous recombination repair because of BRCA mutation? So, I started collaborating with uh, Thomas Helliday. Unfortunately, because PARP had now entered um, clinical trials, it was closed down um, as a drug development project um, in 2003. However, we generated a decent amount of data and I continued to co uh, collaborate with uh, Thomas Helliday. And we came up um, with the identification of the synthetic lethality. And this really changed how PARP inhibitors were used and indeed how we think about treating cancer um, as a whole. So the concept is relatively simple. If you have two complementary pathways, in this case, base excision repair and homologous recombination repair, the loss of one of the pathways, e.g., homologous recombination due to BRCA mutation leads to the genomic instability that um, makes the cancer cell arise. However, 
that cancer cell is now relying on POP for the um, repair of the most common type of endogenous DNA damage, such that when you come in with a POP inhibitor, these cells will die because they have no means of repairing that damage. But the normal cells, because they've still got homologous recombination repair, are enabled to survive. And this was the paper that came out that really showed this. And this is the data that, that we generated. So I don't know if you've noticed these little names popping up. These correspond to the people who, who did these experiments. So B, B78 cells, Chinese hamster lung fibroblasts, completely resistant to the PARP inhibitor. But those that were defective in BRCA2 were very, very sensitive. So you're getting about um, one to two percent survival at a dose that doesn't really affect the wild type and doesn't affect um, cells when you put BRCA2 back into it. And then growing these as xenografts, the only ones that responded were ones that were defective in BRCA and were treated um, with the PARP inhibitor. So um, will it work in humans? So um, this is work that Yvette Drew did, and she, she showed that she took a panel of human cancer cell lines that were either wild type or heterozygous for um, uh, BRCA, and uh, she treated uh, them with um, Recaparib for 24 hours um, and look for gamma H2AX and RAD51 to confirm that DNA damage was occurring and it was being repaired by homologous recombination. And the pink bars are the Recaparib treated ones and the gray bars are the are irradiated um, cells um, that we used as a positive control for our gamma H2AX foci. And as you can see, 24 hour exposure to um, PARP inhibitor causes as much DNA damage as does the standard fraction of ionizing radiation. And this didn't differ between wild type and um, uh, repair defective, homologous recombination repair defective cell lines. I know it looks like these are, have lower ones, but this is paired with this cell line and there's no significant difference there. However, there was a significant difference in terms of um, RAD51 and uh, these, uh, you can see that the ones that were um, mutant uh, homologous recombination repair defective um, made fewer RAD51 foci than the wild types and that corresponded to much greater cytotoxicity. Um, and then we get, went into xenografts, and um, we found that uh, recaparib on its own um, would um, reduce the growth of capan ones, which is pancreatic xenograft um, effective in BRCA2. And that if you used a longer schedule, um, uh, you got better tumor growth control, but um, it didn't um, affect the growth of the mice, it was not toxic to the mice. They continued to grow, um, whether they were wild type or heterozygous for BRCA2. But of course, the proof of the pudding comes in the clinical trial. And uh, unfortunately, because we were so busy doing um, combination um, studies, um, Alaparib overtook uh, Recaparib in terms of clinical trials as a single agent. And because the data had been had come out about the synthetic lethality, they they, they switched um, to looking uh, specifically at patients that had BRCA mutations. And they found that out of 19 quite heavily pretreated breast, ovarian or prostate cancers, they found 12 responses. And that was really quite remarkable. And here you can see both the stable disease partial responses and one complete response uh, in these patients. And this was accompanied by very mild side effects, mostly nausea and fatigue. But what was then found was that not all of the responders had BRCA mutations. So um, this is a waterfall plot. 
this represents growth of the tumor anything above this is the baseline tumor size and that this represents shrinkage and this represents growth but as you can see um, the the BRCA mutant ones are the dark and light greens um, and yes they're represented here um, but they're also represented here um, and then the magenta and the blue lines are um, non-BRCA mutated um, and you can see they're responding as well so so wh why is this well BRCA mutations are just the tip of the iceberg there's loads more than I've shown here um, these are just some of the principal um, genes involved in the homologous recombination pathway and more and more things are being uh, identified every day so how can we possibly identify those patients that have the defect that can be exploited by a PARP inhibitor? So we went back to um, the, the drawing board and we thought we'd do a functional assay based on RAD51 focus formation um, as Yvette had shown in the cell line data um, here. And, and this is what they look like under the microscope. These are the gamma H2AX foci, and these are the RAD51 foci. So then the next bit of um, good luck was to start a collaboration with the ovarian cancer surgical group who um, had a string of um, clinic, uh, clinicians who wanted to do fellowships, and there just weren't enough projects to go around. And so I'd been thinking along these lines in that um, the standard of care for ovarian cancer is carboplatin based and homologous recombination defects confer sensitivity to carboplatin and there is an initial 60% um, response rate to carboplatin therapy. However, only 20% of ovarian cancers have either germline or somatic BRCA mutations. So my hypothesis was that the BRCA mutation frequency was seriously underestimating how many homologous recombination defective tumors were out there that would potentially uh, benefit from PARP. Um, you may know ovarian cancer as the um, silent killer because um, that's what it is. You've only got about 50% survival for five years. Um, so there was a clear unmet clinical need. There was an availability of samples and um, our champion Stenik Hostomsky, who had been at Aguron, managed to fund this study from Pfizer. So this is, um, this is some of the ovarian cancer st statistics. As you can see, there's been um, no improvement in the uh, death versus the new cases um, for a very long time. Most of them are the high-grade serous ovarian cancer. And whereas most of them, the cancers um, are in women over the age of 60, uh, 55, um, there are still a substantial proportion of women under this age. And I'm in this bracket now. And I, I, I don't think I want to, to die quite yet either. So um, uh, this, is, this is where... We come to now um, because through these studies, we found that more than 50% of ovarian cancers would be potentially exploitable uh, with a PARP inhibitor. So this is the work of Asima Muktapadai, who took um, ascites from the patients that she was operating on. Um, ethically, um, of course, they consented. Um, these patients had no family history. There was, uh, they weren't screened for BRCA mutations. She exposed them to recaparib for 24 hours and looked for RAD51 foci. And nine of the 25 uh, were able to make RAD51 foci, but the other 16 weren't. The same nine that made the RAD51 foci were resistant to recaparib in terms of growth inhibition, whereas there was growth inhibition in the other group. And there was only this one that was different, and we think this had gone into senescence. Um, a year later, the um, TCGA came up with a similar sort of result. So we'd found that 
55 to 60 percent uh, of the patients were homologous recombination defective and they found 51. So it's possible that we were picking up more things than they were measuring. Um, and then uh, subsequently, there have been other studies of which this is one. And again, it's coming up with a pretty similar um, level of homologous recombination defect. When um, these patients then unfortunately went on to progress and die, those that we found, and these patients were all being treated with carboplatin, and you would predict that uh, a defect in homologous recombination would make them more sensitive. Uh, and in fact, those ones that homologous recombination defective had a longer progression fee and overall survival. So, um, there are other methods to identify um, HRD tumors, simplest being obviously BRCA mutations, but obviously it won't pick up everything. They've also looked at gross genomic uh, changes, and they'll identify ones that have been homologous recombination defective at some stage in the history, but not necessarily still homologous recombination defective. There are expression arrays and these have been pretty much unsuccessful. And then there's our functional assay. It's challenging because it requires viable tumor, but it does give an answer in real time when you're wanting to know exactly what to give the patient. But then Rocaparib, um, this is um, the definitive trial that led to its, um, its licensing, its approval. And this is where they took... Um, patients who had high-grade serous ovarian cancer, and they divided them into three. There was the entire population, the intention to treat. There were those that were BRCA mutant, and there were those that had um, evidence of having homologous recombination defective uh, defects, but weren't BRCA mutant. And so you have this cohort this cohort and you have the whole population and as you can see whether you pick the BRCA mutant the HRD co cohort or the intention to treat in all cases you saw that um, recaparib increased the um, median time to progression um, and, and you can see the placebos had about a five month progression-free survival, whereas um, those treated though with recaparib had very much greater and even the intention to treat lived um, more than or rather uh, failed, were progression-free for um, at least twice as long. So now there are nine PARP inhibitors. Uh, there, there are four PARP inhibitors that are approved um, and there are more that are um, in clinical trial. Um, those that are approved, they're approved in ovarian and breast and um, prostate cancer and uh, pancreatic cancer um, will probably um, be the next one. So, but, but we wanted to see how, um, how other cancers might respond. And so we did our... Um, uh, homologous recombination functional assay um, in um, pleural effusions um, from patients who had mostly lung, lung cancer, but also metastatic cancer um, to the lung. And um, as you can see, out of four, and this is a small study, but out of four of the non-small cell lung cancers, um, three of them were failed to make um, enough RAD51 foci to be counted as homologous recombination proficient, and potentially these um, patients would benefit from a PARP inhibitor. <coughs> One of the two mesotheliomas as well, and then of course um, uh, one of the ovarians uh, as well. So uh, we then went on to look at um, more tumor types. And we just took um, ascites samples from anybody who would um, consent. 
and were being drained anyway. Um, and uh, we found that out of 24, um, eight were defective in homologous recombination. And so um, there probably are lots of uh, cancers out there that would be benefit from PARP inhibitors, which are really not a toxic sort of therapy. Um, most of the patients who are taking the PARP inhibitors really feel quite well. Um, so, but why are PARP inhibitors the perfect example of synthetic lethality? Well, base damage and single strand breaks are the commonest type of endogenous damage. And the, the rate is between 10 and 100,000 lesions per cell per day. And it's going to be higher in cancers due to the inflammation. PARP dependent base excision repair is the first line of defense and homologous recombination is the backup pathway. At least 50% of high grade serous ovarian cancer and a lot of other cancers are defective in homologous recombination. So PARP is targeting cells with a common D DDR defect uh, to the most common type of endogenous DNA damage. Um, I think I'll skip this in the interest of time. Um, but uh, just to say that um, Rucaparib seems to give the most durable PARP inhibition. It seems to be a accumulating in cells um, up a, 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 over a concentration gradient. We couldn't identify what was carrying it in. But this was um, uh, a really interesting experiment. We we treated the cell, uh, the mice, with a single dose of um, rocaparib, and we found that their part was in the part was inhibited in the tumor for a week. Um, and when we compared the efficacy of um, a daily schedule or a once weekly schedule, um, we saw good tumor growth control for either schedule and um, neither were particularly toxic. And perhaps the weekly schedule was less toxic overall. <coughs> and it seems as though Rucaparib only has this durable, is the only of, one of the PARP inhibitors that have this durable effect. So Rucaparib is here shown in gray. Um, this is um, the activity, the PARP inhibition um, when the cells have been pre-incubated for an hour and um, then harvested and their PARP activity is measured in comparison to where we've added the same concentration of PARP inhibitor into the reaction mixture. And as you can see, Rucaparib is still inhibiting PARP um, by at least 75 to 80 percent, 72 hours after it's been taken away. Um, so the, these, these cells have been incubated for three days in drug-free medium, whereas for the other PARP inhibitors, there's a time-dependent decrease in PARP inhibition, and there's only modest PARP inhibition with talisoparib and um, a structurally related um, PARP inhibitor that isn't um, approved yet uh, that looks quite similar in terms of chemical structure to recaparib. So um, I'll also skip this um, and this. So um, yes, in summary, it took seven years to make an inhibitor that was 10, a thousand times more potent than the prototype and a further three years to identify the clinical candidate and another three to then start clinical trials. But that was in combination with temozolomide. However, the synthetic lethality was identified in 2005, and that was a, a pivotal, pivotal step that was confirmed clinically only four years later. Um, different doses and schedules are tolerated and needed when used in combination or a single agent, and uh, we can measure HRR function in patient tissue, and um, the defects in this pathway are relatively common in a variety of cancer types. But to emphasize that this would not have happened had it not been for the synergy between science and serendipity. So in terms of science, we did 
uh, we were developing inhibitors based on the mechanism. Serendipitously, there was a spontaneous rearrangement that increased potency, and we met with uh, Stenikos Stompsi from Aguron. That led to crystal-based drug design, which gave us one that was very avid for the active site, and it sticks to the enzyme, and the inhibition is retained with processing and storage, which meant that we could then do uh, pharmacodynamic assays. Um, and then, of course, Alex Burkle made it possible for us to do it on patient uh, samples because of his sensitive assay. And then connecting the uh, findings on the sensitivity of homologous recombination of PARP inhibitors um, that Thomas Helliday had done to the role of BRCA in homologous recombination to identify a therapeutic potential um, led to us uh, finding the, the synthetic lethality, which of course wouldn't have um, been much of a, an issue had it not been for the fact that single strand breaks are the most common type of endogenous damage. Then um, platinum therapy data in ovarian cancer suggested that many were homologous recombination and um, serendipitously, um, I formed a collaboration with the Gyne Onc group um, for um, synthetic lethality. You need continuous inhibition of PARP and uh, Rucaparib gives very durable PARP inhibition. So this has been a, a very long story um, and um, I hope I've, I've mentioned most of these people, um, if not actually said them, their names will have propped up on the um, uh, various slides, but uh, the chemists at Newcastle, Roger Griffin, um, led um, that were led by Roger Griffin and Bernard Golding, and at Aguron, um, Steve Weber led uh, largely Stacey Cannon and Don Skalitsky um, in their chemistry uh, uh, endeavors, and Bob Almasi was the um, uh, uh, crystallographer. Then my first PhD student and subsequent PhD students, um, technicians um, at Newcastle did a lot of the in vitro work um, and Karen Magley at Aguron uh, also did identified a lot, screened a lot of compounds. Then the pharmacologists at Newcastle and at Aguron, the clinicians, um, Yvette, uh, Chris and Ruth, were initially my um, uh, clinical fellows, and it was Hilary Calvert who started the drug development group off. Asima as another clinical fellow of mine who, who did the, um, the ascites work, and Richard Edmondson, Miranda, Ashley, and Lucy did uh, the other tumor types. Of course, none of this would have been possible without our collaboration with Helen Bryant and Thomas Helliday at Sheffield. Kay Williams at Manchester for the radio potentiation, and of course, Stenik Kostomsky and Garrett Loss uh, at first Iger, uh, at, at first Ageron and then Pfizer, and most importantly, the patients and their families who let us um, take their tissues to work on, and the funders, CR UK, Ageron, Pfizer, and uh, local charities um, as well. So thank you. I hope I haven't gone on too long there.